Good morning. <laughs> Happy New Year. My name's Chad. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's a joy just to come together and start a new, brand new series called In the Beginning. Uh, we're jumping into the book of Genesis. We figured God started with it, so why not us? Um, so we're going to go after it this year. I do want to pray for us. Uh, I want to welcome those who are watching online, or if you couldn't be here this morning and are watching later, the Lord can meet you wherever you are. And so uh, we're thankful for you, thankful if you're new or if you've been here many times, uh, confident that Jesus can and will speak to your heart today. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for just sweet times to sing truths, Lord, that are eternal, uh, such as hallelujah, our God reigns. Uh, Lord, we're, there are plenty of things we could just right now look at the headlines and say, whoa, I'm not sure who's reigning. And so, Lord, we say a different story, one according to your word, according to your spirit, that you are reigning. You are not surprised. You are not worried. You are not up in heaven wringing your hands about the political goings on of the world. Uh, you're in charge. And so, God, we kind of, we come together to acknowledge that and to say, Lord, we trust you. Um, we believe. We also say, help our unbelief. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, the times and seasons, and thank you, God, for a new decade to trust you and to love you. We ask that as we uh, open up uh, the Word of God, um, starting on page one, Lord, that you would um, start something fresh in us. Uh, Lord, let us hear your voice. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So you're five days into the new decade, what kind of questions are rolling around your head right now? What kind of things are you hoping will change? What things did you do last year that you for sure don't want to do this year? What things did you struggle with in 2019 that you are so glad that God is not going to have you struggle with them anymore in 2020? Um, what are you, who are you praying for? What are you hoping will happen with a job? What are you hoping will happen in a relationship, in your marriage, with your kids? What are you hoping will happen in our country, around the world? There's lots of things that we can bring before the Lord. And it's one of those things where, you know, we say around here, Jesus is the most important person in the room. We're not neglecting the Father, God the Father, or the Holy Spirit. We believe that he is a trinity, triune God, uh, one God in three persons. But it's clear in the Bible, and specifically as we see Jesus take on flesh, what we just celebrated at Christmas, the Bible goes out of its way to say there is one name under heaven, right? Right? There's one name by which we can be saved. Those who call on the name of Jesus. And so that's why we say he's the most important person in the room. We see in the book of Revelation, what happens at the end of time? Who comes back? Jesus comes back. He is our access point to God. And we have the Holy Spirit as a deposit in the meantime to fill us, to lead us, to guard our hearts. But we say he's the most important person in the room. The second thing we say, which isn't as well known, but Daniel said it in the video, is that Jesus is truth. Not that he says true things. He actually is truth. He's the source of truth. And his words give life. Now, here's a question. Do you believe that? Like for reals, do you believe that? Is that something that is a part of your personal daily practice to believe that the words that are here give life? So let's say you struggle a little bit, I do, to be consistent. And you finally come back and you're like, ah, I saw that verse on Facebook. Somebody put that dumb picture with the verse on it. And so I guess I should maybe read the Bible. And so we reach for our favorite chair, a big old blanket, a cup of hot chocolate in the book of Genesis. No, we don't, do we? We go for Romans 8. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who can separate us from the love of God? Shall angels or life or death or principalities or Philippians 4? I can do all things through Jesus, who through Christ, who strengthens me. Or First John, this is how we know what love is because God loved us. John three sixteen, God so loved the world. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. We don't go in the beginning. God created that. Like that's not our like 
yeah, man, I'm going to pin that on my mirror. I'd like, we don't do it. And so I started, and I want you to know something, and this is the case for anybody that teaches around here. I just can't do it where I just teach, teach it to you and not be in it myself. So you can rest assured that if I'm teaching it, I'm wrestling through it with you. I've been sitting with this and I opened up Genesis chapter one as I started to read and I was like, I have read this so many times, Lord. I need you to open my heart and just show me something. And so that's how we approach it. So if we believe that God's word, all of it, just like 2 Timothy 3.16 says, is inspired by God, breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness, that we can be complete and equipped in every good work. We gotta be honest about certain parts of the Bible that we like to keep in the attic of our hearts, in a dusty box. And Genesis is one of those. And so we thought, hey, let's pull it out of the box. Let's go after it. And one of the reasons is, of all the things that God could start with for your heart to know him, he starts with Genesis. He starts with Genesis. That's the story he wants to tell you. So what kind of questions are answered in the book of Genesis? What kind of questions do we ask? How do we get here? Where are we going? Who made all this stuff? Was it created? Did, we, did it just evolve over billions of years as a popular thing that we hear many times in culture? Does it matter if I believe one way or the other? God says, I'll answer those things for you. The same questions that we have about those things have been in the minds of everyone in every generation, all the way back to the Israelites. After the Exodus, they're wandering around the desert. So just, you know, like complaining and where's the food Moses I want to go back to you like all this stuff and God says I'm going to give you not only the law we know that that's where we got the Ten Commandments we can picture Charlton Heston on the top of the mountain you know if you've ever not watched if you've not watched that you got to watch it just classic Hollywood Ten Commandments Charlton Heston but God also gave Moses the complete first five books of the Bible wrote them down And they're wandering, they're worried, they're anxious, they're surrounded by enemies. They just came out of slavery and bondage. They have people that hate them there. They're out in the wilderness. It's not like you can build houses out there. It's just desert. They don't have food. They want to know what's going on. And God says, I want to tell you a story. I want to give you hope. I want to give you something to anchor your souls to. And so... We look at, I've always wanted to say this, turn to page one. In your Bibles, open your device, look on the screen, or just just listen. Close your eyes, I'll wake you up in a minute. Here we go. Genesis 1, just two verses to start. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, And the spirit of God was, just got to picture stuff, okay? Just (sighs) hovering over the face of the waters. Now, God wants to tell us a story. When I tell stories, and you can ask my wife, we'll be sitting with some friends and I'll start telling a story. And I just love the best part of the story. And so many times I just skip a lot of things, just skip details. And so I'll start telling the story and she'll go, nope, wait a minute. You got to tell them this. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. And this is just, no, stop. Just let me do it. <laughs> it's also the case that when I come home from something, like let's say I've been gone, I come home and I've had this amazing experience, it's been awesome and spent time with all these people. And I come home, she goes, so tell me about it. I'm like, well, it was good. <laughs> She's like, you're no help. Ridiculous. Leave out so many details. The cool thing, while I may do that, is God in Genesis doesn't leave out anything that you don't need to know. Like he gives you every detail, everything that your heart will need. And God is telling a story and it's not just any story. It's not just, hey, let me spin this yarn. Let me just tell you this great thing that happened. It's kind of cool. Yeah, throw in the Bible. Why not? Put it the first book because nobody reads the first book anyway. Everybody's going to flip to the back. No, he says, let me tell you the story of stories. Now, why do I say the story of stories? Because it's history. 
It's the story of history. That was what God was trying to say, giving it to Moses. I kind of, I try to picture these things. Like we forget about Moses, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writing these things down. He's got like a couple of million people. So just kind of imagine him being like, hey, everybody, everybody, I got some more stuff. Just wanted to read a couple of things that I got. How do you get 2 million people, 3 million people with their kids and everybody, they start passing these stories one to another, tells it to one group, they tell it to others. They pass the story, but of all the things that you could hear, this was the first thing God wanted to tell them. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Now this, there's a, there's a huge effort over the last 25 years, really started 200 years ago, to say, ah, this is not history. This is poetry and it's just myth. There are other myths out there, other ancient Near Eastern documents. And it's just kind of one of many. And you know, God was like, well, I guess I need one too. And so let's just have, throw another one in the box. No way. God would say, this is my word. Special divine revelation. This is history. I want to give you history. The Bible is set apart as the only word that comes from divine Revelation. Now, how can we be sure of that? We use scripture to interpret scripture. And so our like number one reason for believing that this is the word of God and this, if you want anything, even if you're not, not big into apologetics or come like debates and have all the rules, here's the one you can always say, Jesus believed it. Jesus spoke about Genesis. In fact, in the New Testament, did you know that it is referenced? Genesis, just the book of Genesis is referenced over 200 times in the New Testament. Not like, yeah, that's old stuff. Let's talk about all the new Jesus stuff. No, Jesus, Paul, Peter, many of them referencing Genesis over 200 times. They must have thought it was important, important to ground us there. So in the beginning, God, it starts with a person. Now listen, I'm gonna be saying stuff this morning and I'll just say this about any sermon. You're not listening for comprehension of everything. You're listening for one thing. You always want to come into something when you're listening to God's word and go, God, that's it right there. That's what you were trying to say to me. And, and I'm totally fine if you just tune out the rest of the time and you start thinking about how God is going to begin applying that part. And that's what happens to me when I listen to people, sorry, people that teach and preachers and whatever. I, I don't hear everything you say. That's the case for you too. I'm okay with that. It's okay for me, but I want you to be hearing and saying, Lord, what is this you wanna to speak to me? He says, I wanna start with me as a person in the beginning, God. Not, he wasn't created. He can't be God if he was created. He always has been. When Moses asks God, when he's seeing him in the burning bush and he tells him, I want you to go to Pharaoh. He says, who should I say is sending me. What's the answer? Remember, I am. You are what? I just am. I just am. Not I'm, I can't be boiled down to any description. I just am. I always have been. But here's the thing. It's not, I, and I think about this, like here's God in eternity past and there's no earth yet. There's no people. And he's like, mm, kind of bored. I know. No, not that. Oh, I'll make. That's not what happened. What scripture tells us, and we get a clue again from Jesus in John 17, he starts praying. And guess who he's praying for? Disciples and us. He was praying for us. And you know what he wanted more than anything? For you to be able to see him, but not just you know, Jesus incarnate. He wanted you to see him in all of his glory. And so he says, Father, can you show them my glory, which you gave me because you loved me? And listen to this, here's the kicker. Before the foundation of the world. What does that tell us? And we see this in other places in the Bible that God existed in a perfect relationship before any of this was ever here. Complete and perfect in their relationship. Why does this matter? Well, scripture tells us our relationships, when they're broken and busted, when we're struggling with sin, when we look and we look at our headlines and we see everybody screaming at each other and all the wars and all this, and this person saying this, guess what that is the result of? Separation from that perfect relationship 
with God. That's where it comes from. Think about your own relationships. You know, I, and then we don't have it all the time. Like sometimes you're just with your family and you're like, hey, do you know? <laughs> just like, fine, good to see you too. You know, you get up and you're like, yep, love you. Like sometimes I get laughing sometimes because like inevitably it's always where one person is a little more affectionate and excited about saying I love you. Like to my kids, I'm like, oh, I love you, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> and other times it's, it's like I'm in a kind of frustrated moment and one of my kids will come up and I'm like, I really love you, dad. And you're like, yeah. How about those moments though when you, and I've had this happen with Lisa, like sometimes, or my kids, I'll just be sitting in a room and we're not talking, we're just hanging out. I'll look over and I'll just be like, man, Lord, I just really love her. I have this deep longing and affection for my bride and for my kids. And where's that come from? Jesus says, <laughs> Before the foundation of the world, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this whole thing that you feel, those emotions, that longing, that desire, that whole thing that makes you say, I want to really experience love, or at all came from God. In the beginning, God existed before anything was there. And he said, it was perfect. It was beautiful. He wasn't bored. He didn't need to make you, but he made creation to show his glory. God created the phrase heavens and the earth is like saying everything that you see, everything that you don't see. He made it all. Everything that exists. The word that's used for create there, I am not a Hebrew scholar. I had a little bit of Greek in college, never took Hebrew, but it's bara and it's only used with God. Nobody else gets that word. Nobody else can do it because he creates absolutely. Absolute creative power means he doesn't need something else to make something. So we say, yeah, I built that house or I made this art project. So I'm making a look at it and go, oh, hey, sheetrock, wood, paint, nails, relative creativity means I had to use something. God creates with absolute power, meaning out of nothing. He creates, nobody else can do that. So we have here, and they have this description of the earth is void and formless. And I gotta tell you this, God was kind of peeling stuff back for me. And I was like, oh, I never thought of that. I never thought of that. Watery, mass, clay, darkness. There is no light. It cannot be inhabited by people. Just imagine just this mass of material and the spirit of God is hovering over. And another word that they used is brooding. And so I just, and I'm visual and I have to think about these things. So I thought about Lake Winona. I know. And it's like, it's little, but it still scares me to death when I'm driving down in the middle of the night and it's a frozen lake. I almost every time I drive back, I was like, what if my car went in there and I went to the bottom? Oh, that'd be awful. <laughs> I know that's weird, but I think about that stuff like, no, you know, grab the steering wheel a little tighter. <laughs> so imagine all of the material that makes up our earth, our galaxies, all the other galaxies that we can't even see. It's just sitting there. It's dark. It's not, now he created it. He created this, oh my goodness. I didn't even say anything. He created this massive, sorry, my watch was talking to me. Material, it's raw material. It hasn't been formed yet. It hasn't been created. It is just sitting there and God is hovering. He's brooding over it. And one of the scholars, kind of a theologian who's also a scientist said, no doubt the things that we know, the physics, the laws of nature, gravity, the pull, electromagnetic forces, all this kind of stuff that I don't even really know a lot about. All the stuff that we would say, waves, sound waves, light waves, all the stuff that we would say makes up our universe. God was just sitting there, just about ready to strike and unleash it. Now, why is that important? Take a step back. Okay, remember who's, who's hearing it? Israelites, <laughs> what are we gonna do? We just left Egypt, I mean, it was really good there. And, or take you. I don't know what's gonna happen with this. I don't know how I'm gonna get through this. Why do I keep struggling with this sin? How am I gonna make these bills paid? And God says, here's what you need to know. His spirit, the one who has always been, is hovering with power 
power and potential and can do anything he wants. And he looks at the chaos and the darkness and the disorder that is in front of him in the world. And he looks at the chaos and the darkness and the disorder of your life. And he says, just watch what I'm going to do. Now, let's pull back the curtain a little bit. I know that Genesis 3, when it talks about the fall and the seed, the promise of Jesus, you see the first glimpse of the gospel, but I'd never thought about the first two verses of Genesis having a hint at the gospel, but they do. What do I mean? What themes of redemption are hidden and implied in this beginning? Our lives without Jesus, what are they? Void, empty, dark, chaos. What do we do to deserve God doing something with that emptiness, that void, that chaos, that darkness? Nothing. He just decides to act. And that raw material that is our lives, broken though they are, it's his. It belongs to him. He spoke us into existence and he alone can bring order from chaos. So maybe, just maybe, Those Israelites are walking around worried. You who might be walking around worried and anxious need to hear this story of stories where God is saying, you know what? I got this. I got this. I know what I'm doing. I have always been. I answer to no one. They answer to me. I created all material. I bring order and chaos. And right now I am hovering over your life. And I can do something about it. So what does it look like when he does something? Verse three, is the longer portion of scripture. I want you to sit back. Again, you can close your eyes. You can just listen. But I believe that the reading of scripture is something that God has given us. We don't have to explain it. Just the reading of the divine, inerrant, inspired word of God can do something in your life, which is why it's so important for you to read it every day. So just listen. Just let it kind of wash over you. Don't get anxious about how long it's taken. And it's about 10 or 12 verses. It's okay. We will get there. But just let God do his thing. Familiar verses, but let's read them. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. There was evening, there was morning, the first day. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse heaven. There was evening and there was morning the second day. Now that heaven is not the heaven that you think about. So just put that there somewhere. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place Let the dry land appear. So just imagine Africa. There you go. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. The waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God said, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruits, fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed. So just imagine, was the last time you had a strawberry, like a really good strawberry or an apple, not a red delicious, but a honey crisp. You know what I'm saying? Like a good one, a good Minnesota apple. God said, Bleep. there it is. I did that. His word, each according to its own kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, much to the chagrin of many children, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the third day. He's giving you history here, folks, okay? Not myth, not poetry. He's telling you what happened. Verse 14, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. Let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so, and God made the two great lights, the greater light, which we know as the sun to rule the day and the lesser light, the moon to rule the night and the stars. Oh yeah, a few billion here, a few billion there. Name, 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 name. Named them all, no big deal. God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. 
evening and there was morning the fourth day and God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures so that we can fish for them and let birds fly above the earth so that we can shoot them. <laughs> Just, you know, when you're in Rome. Um, except for eagles. We do not shoot eagles across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. And you better believe that every animal on this earth, every bug, every mite, every whatever knows exactly who he is. In response to his voice, let the birds multiply in the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creeping things, beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds. Everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And what phrase is repeated over and over throughout this section? Yeah, there's about three of them. God said it was good and it was so over and over. The one I want to focus on is, and God said every second on average. So there's a second 6,000 tweets are tweeted on Twitter. There's another six. There's another 6,000. There's another 6,000. Every minute, 350,000 tweets. 500 million tweets a day, 200 billion tweets per year. That's just Twitter. Snapchat, over 2 million snaps are sent every minute. Now, so many words, right? So many words. And not all bad, not all good, because there's definitely, like, we, who hasn't seen something? Somebody's written something online with a picture or a story, and you're like... Oh man, you gotta watch this. You know, you're so moved. And who hasn't also read something and just had your blood boiling, right? So many words. Now contrast that with, and God said. God said. He is speaking things into existence. He's blessing them. He's calling them good. This is the Trinity at work. If you want to know what that looks like, the New Testament puts some skin on it for you. And here you go. John chapter one. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He's talking about Jesus. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Hebrews 11. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible, creating out of nothing, that bara word, only for God. He just spoke. He just spoke. He can create. He can recreate. He can renew. He can bring order from chaos. Some examples. Matthew chapter 8, a leper comes to Jesus. Chaos, disorder, darkness, disease. And he says to Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus touches him and says, I'm willing, be clean. And it happens. He just says it. A centurion, very powerful man, lots of people under him, comes to Jesus on his knees and says, my servant is dying will you come and heal him? Jesus says, I'm coming. And the guy says, and this is a beautiful picture of what it means to be humble before the Lord, what it means to own your own sin, what it means to recognize him as Lord says, no way. I can't have you come to my house. I'm not worthy. And what does he say? Just say the word. Just speak. And you can imagine Jesus sitting there going, yeah, I know how to do that. I spoke stars into existence. I just, you have to think about him as God, fully God, fully man, standing there in front of somebody like this, asking if he can maybe heal him, if he can maybe heal his servant. And Jesus is remembering back when he spoke worlds into existence and he speaks and it happens. Lazarus, Jesus, four day dead friend. Sealed up in the tomb. He says, open the tomb. He speaks it. He doesn't go in there and go, ah, Lazarus, 
No, he stands out and what does he do? Lazarus, come forth. And God said, the same God spilling from the pen of the psalmist, him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens, he sends out what? His voice. That's it. That's all it takes. He sends out his voice. Elijah doesn't hear him in the earthquake, doesn't hear him in the fire, doesn't hear him in the wind. What does he hear him in? Still small voice. That's all it takes. What's the point? The eternal triune God is saying to those Israelites who are wandering around worried and Moses is getting the story and he's saying to us today, yeah, I created all of it and it was easy. I wasn't even flexing my muscles. It was easy. I was just speaking. I just said the words. His is the only word that accomplishes what it says it's going to do. It's always true. It's always fixed and firm. It cannot be changed or made to do something that it isn't. It stands forever. In a world that seeks to redefine truth daily, relative truth that says, ah, it's your truth. This is my truth. How do you feel about that? Then define your truth. Jesus says, no, my word stands. And when I say something, it happens. I'll give you one verse in that whole long section that was very new for me this, this week as I was studying. And it's verse three. And it's where God says, let there be light. This was astounding to me. And I don't know how I never saw it before. That wasn't when he made the sun. He made the sun in verse 14. In verse three, and some of the guys that I was reading, the scholars writing about this, it's, he said it's almost as if God was standing there over the darkness, there's no light. And he just says, watch this. Oh, just light emanating from his person over the darkness. And what do we read in John chapter one? The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not understand it. It's in the same passage when he's talking about the world being made. He is putting forth light. It's the same for our lives, wants to shine on us. Now it's one thing to be in awe of God and his creative powers. Like, wow, that's amazing. You would do that just by saying it. It's another thing for that voice to be calling out to you. Last few verses, let me make that point. Verse 26, then God said, that's different, okay? He's just made all this other crazy cool stuff, billions and billions of stars, planets, water, birds, all that stuff. And then there's a change, there's a difference. And he says, let us make man in our image. Not let's start this little ball going in this like microscopic animal and see what happens over millions of years. That is not in here, folks. That is not in here. He's saying, let's do something. Let me show you something. God in our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created, again, the word is only for him. Man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, Minnesota and Wisconsin, we do that well, over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food to every beast of the earth, every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I've given it to you for food. And it was so God saw everything he had made and behold, it was very good. There was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. God has spoken amazing worlds into being, stuff that we all travel. Like we'll travel, we'll get on a plane, we'll get in a car for hours to go see the sunrise eight hours away. And we got sunrises here, but it's like, yeah, but you got to see it there. It's amazing. Oh, look, you go see this mountain. We, gotta, we know the wonders of his creation. We are in awe. Even those who would say, I don't believe there is a God will still stand on the beach like this to watch that sunset or that sun. Why? Because it's the wonder of who he is. But God saved his best work for last. Not as a process that where you would, oh, look, look, whoa, a human. That's amazing. No. He said, yeah, I did all that. That was amazing. I just spoke in this, but watch this. And we're going to see as we move on into Genesis, the personal activity of God breathing. But 
in his image. We are God's best work. Unlike the rest of creation, we carry his image, made in his likeness, male and female. Personal act. Now you may say, in his image. Okay, so what? So what? This guy named Francis Schaeffer, who was speaking at a conference, um, just a great man of God, deep thinking on Jesus and walking with the Lord. And somebody asked him, if you had one hour with somebody who didn't know the Lord, how would you talk to them about Jesus? And I was like, man, sign me up. I want to hear how Francis Schaeffer talks to somebody about God. He said, if I had one hour with somebody who didn't know the Lord, I would spend 55 minutes talking to them about what it means to be made in the image of God and five minutes talking to them about the truths of the gospel. Why? Here's why. If we aren't made in God's image, if we just emerged from some primordial slime, then things like right and wrong, morality, immorality, really don't matter. It doesn't matter. There is no source, but if we are made in his image from this perfect relationship, then it matters deeply. If he made you, and I am making the case today that he did, <laughs> okay? Then he has something to say about your life. What are, the, what are the implications? We're finishing here. It explains how we got here. It also tells us where we're going, or at least that he for sure has something to say about where you're going if he started this whole thing. Though our American sensibilities tell us otherwise, scripture tells you that you belong to him. Not you. You're not your own person. You belong to him. It also says for society and all humanity tells us that he makes the rules. If he made the people, he makes the rules. And if he made the rules, then it's his rules and his ultimate and sovereign authority that we must answer to. Whether we want to or not, we will. It also tells us that if we've broken those rules, we will absolutely be judged by them. He has every right to. He made the whole thing up. It also means that the person you interact with at work, the car in front of you, that you think just really needs to know what your horn sounds like, <laughs> the person online. Isn't it crazy that online we somehow think that's not a person on the other side of that? You know, God says about those people, even if those people are exhibiting the fact that they are breaking those rules too, even if they're saying awful things, you know what God says? He says, you know what? That is my creation. I made them. I like them a lot. In fact, I love them. This convicts me terribly. I'm pretty good at holding my tongue this way, but not inside. Oh my goodness. I shred people inside. Shred them. I'm really good at it. If you want to know how, just kidding. <laughs> I need the Lord's grace to speak to, to tell me that person that you think is your enemy. I made them, Chad. I made them. Tremendous implications. So I'm going to have the worship team come forward and those who are going to serve communion. As we begin this decade, this new year, Maybe the first place to start is just to acknowledge that this story is your story. It's yours. And maybe just even in your own prayer time, your own devotions, your own walk with the Lord, maybe if you don't even have those, just start tonight before you go to sleep, laying on your pillow, just praying and saying, Lord, okay, okay, okay. If this is history, I need to find my place under your sovereign creative rule. Maybe it's just time for you to crack this open and sit down with the Lord. There's so many resources for you. You can download, Dave Meyer just mentioned one this week that I started using, the Bible in One Year app. It's amazing. It's amazing. And if you're reading it, and even if you jump in your car and you can't finish reading it, you can listen. You can just pop right over. Technology, wow. Sit with the Lord it's not about quantity, okay? So if you did start one of those reading plans and you're already behind, so what? Spend time with Jesus. 
Listen to his words because the end God said part of creation needs to have some impact in my life and in your life. The grand story, the Lord's words, and finally, you're his work of art. And so are they. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. It's good to remember that. It's good to believe and to know you're a son, you're a daughter, you are deeply loved. There is no pit, as Corey Ten Boom says, there is no pit too deep that you might be in that he is not deeper still and waiting at the bottom with immense love for you. That's the God of creation. That's the one hovering over your life who looks at the chaos and the disorder and says, let me see what I can do. He wants to. Invite those who are serving, come on forward.